lesson. Today we'll be focusing on the last lesson from your Flamingo Reader. Uh, if you haven't been through the chapter yet, pause the video right now and go through the entire chapter before you begin watching it. As I've repeated many times, you need to go through the chapters on your own before you start watching these videos. Otherwise, you will not be able to understand them and you will not get the benefits that you will if you read the entire thing first. Alright? So, let's get into it. Last lesson was written by Alphonse Daudet. He was a French author who was born in 1840, died in 1897. Uh, this is the story is set in the backdrop of the Franco-Prussian War in a little place where called Alsace-Lorraine, which is an area in France. I'll put up a map in the video as well so you guys can actually see where this entire conflict took place. Uh, but basically at that time, Prussia was under control of Bismarck and it consisted of Germany, parts of Poland and parts of Austria as well. So, France has lost the war, France has lost its territory to Prussia and now the soldiers that are taking over have put forth a decree or an order that uh, French is not supposed to be taught in the schools anymore. So, the story deals with themes of language and how important language is to a people and to its identity of an area or a region. Uh, as I've spoken to some of you about this uh, in previous video lectures that uh, how important our mother tongue or how important your language is and usually when an occupying force takes over an area, the first thing they do is try to uh, erase the culture, try to make sure that the people aren't speaking the language. Uh, because as long as you have your language, you have an identity that you can rally behind, you have an identity or you have like a nationalistic sort of pride that you can form a revolution behind. The story is written in the first person perspective and his name is Franz with a Z, not Franz as in the country, but Franz as in a German name. Uh, because Alsace-Lorraine was like bordering Germany at that time so they do share some similarities but they were still like pretty much French they were very much French in fact like they identified as French and now suddenly they're losing their identity and it deals with his uh, experiences in his last day of school being taught French for the last time the most interesting thing is like all the thoughts all the comments everything that you read in the story is from the perspective of a little boy so it's not like he's not giving us like these big huge philosophical speeches and he's not giving us like these huge insights into what is happening it's just a little kid so we're just looking at this story from the perspective of a little kid so keep that in mind as you read it that this is from the perspective of a little child who doesn't really understand what's going on uh, and once he does that's when he realizes oh my god i have messed up so much that's when he realizes the importance of the language not just him but the entire village realizes even his teacher realizes that this is the importance of our language this is the importance of our culture this is the importance of being french for us so let's just get into the video i'll put forth a summary and analysis and everything and then just i'll talk about a little bit about the chapter as well so i hope you guys have fun and let's get into the video
So I hope everybody has been through the previous sections of the video properly. Like I said, you can pause it and rewind it as many times as you like. Just go through the chapter along with the themes that I've put forth, along with the summary that I've told you in the video. Uh, I'm just going to go through the text a little bit, uh, just talk about a few things that I think are important that I think you should keep in your mind. Uh, there's this exercise in the beginning of the chapter about inferring meaning from context. I think I've explained everybody what uh, inferring meaning from context is. If you haven't, you can look at the other videos that I've put forth or you can uh, make a note of it and bring it up in the video lectures and I'll address it then. Uh, but do this exercise as well, find out the meaning of these expressions in the dictionary, you try to infer the meaning first. Once you make an inference, then try to make sure that your uh, inference was as good as the definition as well. So make an inference, compare it to the definition and that way you can figure out like if you're inferring correctly or not. All right, so, so the story starts off with little Franz telling us that he was very late for school that morning and he was very worried because he was going to get scolded by his teacher. Uh, it says here that he would question us on participles. Now participles are a part of grammar, but since the story was originally written in French and then translated into English, uh, this is dealing with French participles. So this is not English participles, this is not English tense and past participles and present participles and all of that stuff. Uh, that's why I'm not going much into it because like I said, this was originally written in French and then translated into English. So this is like an English translation of the original French text that we are reading at the moment. The birds were chirp chirping at the edge of the woods and in the open field back of the sawmill, the Prussian soldiers were drilling. So as we can see, uh, the Prussian soldiers have already come into the uh, city. They've already started to take over. They've already established a base, so which means that uh, the area has already lost its army. Like the army has been removed from the area. Like they... Uh, so if you look at the second paragraph, it says when I passed the town hall, there was a crowd in front of the bulletin board. For the last two years, all our bad news had come from there. The last battles, the draft, the orders of the commanding officer. So the town bulletin board back in those days was a very important thing. Like I said, this is written in the 1800s, like uh, at the turn of the century. So basically 1870. So there was still 30 years before like 1900s came around, before the First World War came around. So this was basically 30, 40 years before the First World War. So back then, like a village's bulletin board was sort of like the lifeblood of the village where everything happened. Like you could put forth notices of who was getting married, when was like there's going to be a fair or whatever, there was a job or something. So it says here, the last battle is the draft and the orders of the commanding officers. Now, what is a draft? A draft is a process by which a military replenishes its force by enlisting civilians into its army. You can look up the meaning of draft on Google or your dictionary as well, but I'll explain a little bit. For example, like if tomorrow our country goes to war and we are suddenly in a very short supply of soldiers, like the front lines, the war isn't going well, we're losing soldiers. So what will happen is usually they conduct a draft, which means everybody above a certain age is enlisted into the military, which means that you are uh, basically demanded or asked to go into the military. If you refuse, you get sent to jail. Uh, one of the best examples of the military draft would be if you look at 1960s in the Americas when the Vietnam War was happening. America put forth a draft for its uh, citizens and like people like Muhammad Ali opposed the draft because he was a part of the civil rights movement and he realized that he doesn't want to fight a war which he has no stake in. Uh, so he got sent to jail which was one of the most famous examples of a person or a draft happening and somebody refusing to go to into a draft. So if you look at, uh, if you want to read about it, just read about like the history of the Vietnam War, uh, read about the American draft and everything else and that's where you figure out what draft actually means. So if we look at page number three, the third paragraph, usually when school began, there was a great bustle which could be heard out in the street. The opening and closing of desk lessons repeated in unison, very loud with our hands over our ears to understand better and the teacher's great ruler rapping on the table, but now it was all so still. So it uh, gives another example of life in that time, school in that time where students would uh, repeat lessons after their teacher and they had to cover the ears because everybody would be talking at the same time. So it would be really hard for you to hear your own voice. So you would just cover your ears with both of your hands and pretend that you were wearing headphones basically. I mean, back then they had no idea what headphones were, but this is just me giving you an example of what it actually means to cover your ears, to hear yourself better. I don't think I should have been able to, I don't think I should be explaining this to you, but I am for some reason. Uh, teachers, great ruler, rapping on the table. So back then teachers used to be able to hit their children. Now if I hit you, you I get fired from my job or I get put into jail. Basically back then uh, teaching was different, like you were allowed to hit students. I mean back in our time, like even when I studied, so this is just like I was in school what, 11 years ago? 
from the last time I was in school and even back then like you were still allowed to hit kids but it's only in the past decade that we stopped hitting kids in school and everything else and I think that's a good thing I don't think that's a bad thing uh, hitting never solves anything violence never solves any problem if I hit you you're not going to learn anything uh, on the only thing you're going to learn is okay if I do this I'm going to get hit and this uh, idiot is just going to hit me so you're just going to avoid doing anything you're just not going to learn anything but at the same time like you know this is back in the 1800s nobody knew anything like uh, getting hit was a part of life back then like your parents beat the crap out of you your teachers beat the crap out of you everybody just beats the crap out of you if you were a kid back in the 1800s so he was scared so like this little kid Franz who's going to school he's late for school and he's scared that he's going to get um, beaten by his teacher for being late but when he gets to his school this teacher is like no little Franz just go take your seat everything is very quiet everything is very somber and then when he gets into the classroom he realizes like the entire village is there as well uh, little babies little children everybody is there his teacher is dressed up in his formal clothes and everything else usually he would wear those clothes when there was something special uh, or there was an inspection going on or there was prizes to be given and like he was wondering why is my teacher dressed up and everything else. Mr. Hamel mounted his chair and in the same grave and gentle tone which he had used to me said, My children, this is the last lesson I shall give you. The order has come from Berlin to teach only German in the schools of Alsace and Lorraine. The new master comes tomorrow. This is your last French lesson. I want you to be very attentive. What a thunderclap these words were to me. So, uh, as we all know, Berlin is the capital of Germany. If you didn't know that, now you know. Berlin uh, has been the capital of Germany for many, many years. So, they, since now, uh, they are under the rule of Germans, they are under the rule of Prussia, and Otto von Bismarck, who was the leader of Prussia at that time, uh, orders come from Germany that, like, all the territories that we have taken over now shall be teaching only German. French is not supposed to be taught in schools. And their teacher tells them that and like so he says what a thunderclap these words were to me so like thunderclap uh, which means the sound of thunder before lightning so thunderclap to me means like these words hit him like a thunderclap would hit you like when whenever something happens in the sky or whenever there's thunder or whatever it's just a loud sound and you're just shocked right Oh, the wretches, that was what they had put up with the town hall. So, see, see, now, as you can see from his perspective, now he understands, oh, that's why like, everybody was at the bulletin board. This is what was put up at the bulletin board, that now uh, this territory is going to be completely German from now on. Like, we're going to be speaking German, we're going to be learning German, nobody's going to be speaking French, all the culture and everything else is going to be slowly being taken over by Germans. My last French lesson. Why? I hardly knew how to write. I should never learn anymore. I must stop there then. Oh, how sorry I was for not learning my lessons. For seeking bird's eggs and going sliding with the sar, my books that had seemed such a nuisance a while ago. So heavy to carry, my grammar and my history of the saints were old friends now that I couldn't give up. And M. Hamel too. The idea that he was going away, that I should never see him again, made me forget all about his ruler and how cranky he was. So now you see, like he, but the realization hits him all of a sudden. Like I said, as a thunderclap, the realization hits him. Oh my goodness, this is going to be my last French lesson. Is it? Is this it? Am I never going to be able to read French again? Am I, am I never going to be able to write French again? And this is what he realizes. So now he, all of a sudden, like he's going back in his mind, like all the times that he skipped school because back then skipping school was easier than it is now. Like there was no school bus or anything. Like you just lived in the village, you walked to the school in the morning, and then you walked home. That was it. Uh, so he could have like skipped school just to go into the forest and play, go sliding down the river, go sliding, uh, go swimming, go sliding in the mountains, do whatever he wanted to do. So now he realizes like, oh, all the times that I have missed school, all the lessons that I didn't pay attention to, all the times I didn't go to school because I was afraid of my teacher hitting me. All of those things are now seeming like old friends to him. Like right now he's realizing, oh my goodness, everything that I've taken for granted is now being taken away from me. And how do I hold on to it? What do I do to it? So this is like the thought process of a little kid. Like the, he still isn't thinking anything about, oh my goodness, the Germans are coming or this is happening or that is happening. No, he's realizing, oh my goodness, my French lessons are over. My school is over. This cranky headmaster used to beat us with a ruler. Now suddenly seems not so bad anymore. He seems like a really nice guy now. And he's going to miss him. Like this is going to be his last lesson with this French teacher. So this is what... Uh, so on page five, uh, when you look at the second paragraph, now this kid is asked to recite something in school and he's terrified. Like I, if I ask any of you in class to st suddenly stand up and read something that you're not prepared for, you will be scared, right? So there's the same thing with this kid as well. So now he hears M. Hamlet say to him, I won't scold you little Franz. You must feel bad enough. See how it is. Every day we have said to ourselves, bah, I have plenty of time. I'll learn it tomorrow. 
which is we can all relate to it. We don't study when we're supposed to. We don't watch the videos when we're supposed to. And then we show up to video lectures without having watched the video. And like I'm sitting here looking at you, staring at the screen, asking you, has anybody seen the video? And everybody says, no, sir, we haven't seen the video. And that's where you have to realize, like, this is where the story is very important because like this here, like it might be, it might not be as uh, relatable to you because any of you speak English as your first language, right? So it might not be as relatable to you, but it is very relatable to me because like I said, English is my first language. This is what I speak at home. This is how I talk at home. This is how I talk with my family. So from tomorrow, if like suddenly I was told that I couldn't speak English anymore, like uh, English was banned in this country, like for example, uh, like our government puts forth a decree which is not like really that far-fetched to think of like if our government actually was this crazy enough they would have said all right let's just stop teaching English everybody has to speak Sanskrit everybody has to speak Hindi I would be devastated like my entire life my entire identity everything is revolves around this language even though I grew up in this city even though I can speak Hindi fluently even though I can speak Komoni and I can understand all these local languages but they weren't my first language they weren't my first love for a language uh, English was always what was spoken in my house. I grew up listening to music in English. I read books in English, movies, TV, everything else. Uh, don't get me wrong, like uh, I appreciate like the Hindi culture and everything else. I love movies. I speak Hindi with my friends. I grew up speaking Hindi because I grew up in Kargudam. I studied in St. Paul's at the same time. Uh, but in my house, we usually spoke English to each other. Uh, so that's what I mean though. So that way, like uh, uh, for some of you, uh, we had a video lecture where we talked about this thing like if tomorrow China takes over India and then suddenly every one of us has to either speak Mandarin or Cantonese and we can't speak our local languages anymore. It would be a very difficult thing for us like uh, we would lose some of us, many of us would lose our identities completely. Uh, we wouldn't have any idea what to do because our language is a way for us to identify ourselves. I mean as who we are as people to identify ourselves as a people uh, many of us like uh, for example like even in our country if you're up north you speak Hindi if you're down south you speak Tamil you speak Telugu you speak Malayalam uh, so you identify with whatever language your region speaks and that gives you a sense of purpose that gives you a sense of nationality a sense of regional pride right so one of the most important lines in the story is this one because when a people are enslaved as long as they hold fast to their language it is as if they had the key to their prison this is page seven first paragraph so what does this mean when a people are enslaved as long as they hold fast to their language it is as if they had the key to their prison which means that if uh, an occupying force takes over your country takes over your region where you live and suddenly imposes their culture on you as long as you hold fast to your language, as long as you hold fast to your ideals, you still have an identity to fight behind. You can still hold a revolution, you can still revolt against your oppressors, you can still revolt against the people who are trying to push you down because you have your language, you have like a common theme that unites people together, right? For example, another example, like if tomorrow China takes over and then we are still allowed to speak our language but they are ruling over us, we still have something to rally behind, right? We still have our language, we still have our Indian identity to rally behind but if they just suddenly destroyed our language, language and culture and everything and it's enforced us to like adapt their language we don't have anything to rally behind because uh, in a few generations our language would be lost because languages are passed down from generation to generation right so if in a few years they ask us to just speak mandarin and force us to learn mandarin and force us to learn cantonese and whatever in a few years we'll all just forget about our culture like in a few generations so this is very important make a note of this write it down in your notebooks or whatever wherever you want to write it down just keep a note of this this is like the most important line of the chapter eight i'm at paragraph number three all at once the church clock struck 12 then the angelus at the same moment the trumpets of the prussians returning from drill sounded under our windows m hamel stood up very pale in his chair and i never saw him look so tall then he turned to the blackboard, took a piece of chalk and bearing on it with all his might he wrote as large as he could, Vive la France. So this lesson is about to be over. We've seen like little France thinks that this is the best lesson he's ever had. This is the more, most attention he's ever paid. Uh, everybody in the village who's in his classroom at the moment is everybody's getting emotional because it's the last. this might be the last time they get to uh, listen to French or speak French to each other. And as his teacher is leaving, like he finds a new, he sees him in a new light as this respectful old man, respectful gentleman that he feels a great deal of love for his teacher, who he used to hate like a few hours ago, but now like all of a sudden, since he realizes this is his last lesson, he gains a newfound appreciation for what his teacher had done for them. And his teacher before leaving writes, we will love France.
look it up what does that mean i'm not going to explain every little thing to you look up we will love france what does it mean it's a french phrase so that's how the story ends and this is how the chapter ends if you have any questions and everything make notes on the video lecture uh, make notes of whatever you want to ask me and then we can talk about it in our online session i'm going to be ending this with like a question and answers and some more information so i hope this video was very enlightening to you i hope you understand the value of language the value of nationalistic identity of your language what does it mean to be something what does it mean to be indian what does it mean to be french what does it mean to be german like your language is a very much a part of your identity your nationalistic identity and your personal identity as well so i hope you guys have fun and let's just end this video now